Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our worship service this morning, coming out from First Presbyterian Church, uh, Moxville, North Carolina. We are so glad to have you here with us this morning. This is the third Sunday in Lent as we continue our journey to the cross. This is also the first Sunday of the month, and we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. If you would like to gather some elements that could be used for the body and the blood of Christ, get those handy so when it is time you will be able to partake. Next Sunday, March 14th, the youth will be meeting at their regular time of 3, but beginning at 4 o'clock, we invite you to come and drive through to get a uh, little cross made of palms that you will be able to have with you on Palm Sunday later in the month. Um, so, so come and drive through next Sunday to get that palm cross at four o'clock out at the back of the church, the youth will be there to give you a palm cross. There are several announcements for this week. If you have not received the newsletter from Katie, you can access that both on our Facebook page, which those of you watching live, you are there, um, or our church website, FPC. Moxville.com, you can see our latest newsletter. We're coming up on a year of our sanctuary being closed, and so many of our members here at First Presbyterian Church have been faithful with the giving of their tithes and offering, many of you mailing that in, and we give you thanks. If you would like to help with our missions here at the church and would like to share your tithes or give a gift, that can also be done online at our website, again, fpcmoxville.com. And finally, next weekend, the time changes. So don't forget to spring forward and uh, join our live at the right time next Sunday. Let us worship God. Good morning. Let us worship God. Holy One, we gather this day coming just as we are. We are lost, waiting to be found. We are searching, hoping to rejoice. Accept all we bring before you today. Accept our worship, we pray. Let us pray. God, our parent, we gather to open our hearts to you trusting that you will welcome us with open arms. We come to worship you, the one who leads us through times of trial, the one who supports us in sorrow and struggle, the one who is beside us when all is bleak. Holy One, we praise you. God, our shepherd, we confess that we often lose our way. Sometimes we follow like sheep and end up in places that we should not be. At other times, we choose our own paths and end up hitting a dead end. In a moment of quiet, we bring before you those things we have done in our straying and ask that, in your mercy, you will bring us back on track. May we, like the prodigal son, come to ourselves. May we trust and follow you alone. May we listen and follow you alone. May we act after worshiping you alone this day. Amen.
God is gracious <clears throat> and pardons all our shortcomings. May the giver of life forgive us our sins and restore us to the joy of discipleship and service. For the sake of Jesus, our faithful Lord. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope we have some people at home watching. I have one here with me this morning, so I'm glad to have Kayla with us this morning. Today we're going to talk about something called a parable. Now, if you were in our Sunday school class this morning, you heard that a parable is kind of a story that Jesus used a lot to teach lessons to people, to help explain things to people. So today we're going to talk about the parable of 100 sheep, but it's told in a little different way. So we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. 100 sheep. If just a single one were lost, who would notice? <laughs> who counted sheep anyway? Well, the man did. The man had a lot of sheep, 100 of them to be exact. He counted them every day. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, all the way to a hundred. Every day. It took a long time to count all of them. One day the man counted ten, twenty, all the way up to ninety, ninety-one, ninety-two, ninety-three, ninety-four, ninety-five, ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine. Wait a minute. I had a hundred sheep. So he counted again. Still, 99. Well, one of his sheep was missing, and he's responsible for all of those sheep, all 100 of them, not just 99. Well, immediately the man went looking for the lost sheep. He walked and he walked, and he saw nothing. He looked to the right, nothing. He looked to the left, nothing. He listened. Still nothing. And then he heard the bleating of a sheep. Bah, bah. Well, he ran toward the sound, and there she was, the lost sheep. He had found her. She was too tired to follow him home. So he picked her up, and he put her on his shoulders, and he carried her home. He was so happy to have all of his sheep together, that he invited everyone to come and celebrate with him. He was so happy. And some people said, what's so wonderful? You had 99 sheep. What's the big deal if one of them is gone? And the man said, one sheep makes a difference. Without her, something is missing. Now my flock is complete. So what this story tells us and what Jesus was telling us was he's like the man, the shepherd. He had a lot of sheep, and they were all important. And he counted them. He kept up with them very closely, and they were very important. So you, all of you, us, we're all God's sheep. And God cares about each and every one of us. If one of us goes missing, God thinks it's very important. And we might say, well, that's silly to leave the 99 and go look for the one. But you are so very important that God will go looking for you always. So just remember that you are an important sheep and God loves you and cares for you very, very much. So let's say our prayer, the Lord's Prayer, if you'll say it with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.
Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the 15th chapter of Luke, verses 1 through 3, and then 11 to 32. And the sermon and the scripture are intermingled. So listen for the word of God. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. So today our word on the cross, you may have seen earlier, is rule breaker. Jesus was a rule breaker. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners, and according to some of the extra laws, this would make him unclean, and so Jesus should have avoided such people, but he didn't. And the religious leaders grumbled. We learn from Jesus that sometimes it is good to break the rules. Some rules should not have been written in the first place. They are not in line with God's spirit. And it takes being filled with God's spirit and being in a close relationship with Jesus to figure it out. What is what? And when are we called to be rule breakers? It has to be that close relationship because we are really good at deceiving ourselves and thinking we know exactly what is what. The amazing thing to me about God's love and patience is that we have the freedom to choose what we do and what we believe. But part of Jesus' mission on the earth was to show us that while we do indeed have that freedom, true freedom is in Christ. And our freedom to choose otherwise often puts us in bondage because we're choosing the wrong way. We sin. Hamartia. Remember, we miss the mark, as we learned last week. So it is interesting in this opening that we basically have two groups of people here. The sinners and the so-called righteous or religious leaders. And did you notice that it was the sinners and the tax collectors that gather around to hear Jesus, listen to him. The ones who think they know the best do not want to listen to God. The religious leaders do not believe 
that the tax collectors and sinners should be welcomed in God's reign. Jesus says they are. So it's important also to understand the implication of Jesus eating with sinners. Meals symbolized fellowship. To eat together signaled spiritual unity. It's part of the symbolism in our partaking of the Lord's Supper, which we will celebrate today. Even in all our different locations, we will partake of the body and blood of Christ. We are the body of Christ. There is a spiritual unity. The charge against Jesus that he ate with sinners amounted to the charge that he also was a sinner. Jesus knew better. Jesus was a rule breaker. So there are actually three parables that Jesus tells. Kevin shared the story of the one of the lost sheep. There was also the story of a woman who loses a coin. True to the gospel writer Luke's form, he will often lift up a male, the shepherd that lost a sheep, followed by a female, the woman that lost a coin. For you see, Luke was a rule breaker in his day as well. These parables are told in response to the religious leader's indignation that Jesus welcomes and eats with sinners. So we're going to look more deeply at the third story, the story of the lost son. Only we may wonder which son is really lost. The story is often called the parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal means rash or wastefully extravagant giving or in in abundance, um, way over the top. The younger son is referred to as the prodigal son because he gets his inheritance and totally wastes it. But some believe that it should be called the prodigal father. The parable even begins, there was a man who had two sons, Not there was a son who had a father and a brother. This parable is about how extravagant the father's love is toward both of his sons. The parable is about how extravagant God's love is toward all of God's children, including you and me. So Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. There's even more rule-breaking going on here. What we might not understand is that the younger son asking for his inheritance while his father is still living is a total insult. It basically is saying to the father, you are already dead to me. The father has every right to be offended and insulted and to refuse. But the father allows the son his freedom of choice and gives him his inheritance. His freedom of choice, however, really leads to bondage, as we will quickly see. And he winds up living a life without discipline, without control, and he loses everything in wild living, we are told. Remember that wild living. We will hear 
the older brother's slant on that in a moment. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So to tend to the pigs of a Gentile is about as alienated as a Jew could imagine being. This younger son is in exile. You know the saying that sometimes you have to hit rock bottom before you realize your need, your need for help, your need to change, even though everyone around might see it much sooner. Well, starving, broke, in the mud with the pigs, no one to help him, the younger son has hit rock bottom. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Last week, our theme word was repentance, turning around, turning back to God, doing a 180 and changing one's life and one's heart with the help of the Holy Spirit. There is a question here as to whether this is true repentance or just survival. And I don't know. That is God's to judge. But he does turn around to go back home, back to his father. He knows he has disowned his father and has given up his right to be called a son. And so he is willing to go back as a hired hand. And yet, he still calls his father father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now the dad is a rule breaker once again, running out to his son, which was not an acceptable behavior of that day and time, accepting him back and even celebrating rule breaker. Notice that the son does not get to finish his speech about being a hired hand. As soon as the father hears the son call him father and say, I'm not worthy to be your son, he moves to extravagant gestures of acceptance what others might call wasting. We do indeed get a picture of a prodigal father. The younger son does not get what he deserves, but is forgiven and welcomed and loved. The father's compassion restores everything. 
because the younger son has returned, the father believes there is reason for great rejoicing. It would seem that all is well. But what about the older brother? Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. The older son is filled with anger and hurt and jealousy at the father's rule breaking. I can't say that I blame him. Nothing was even said to him about this great celebration. He just happens to overhear the party that's going on that he was not even invited to. He is indignant. Remember the indignant religious leaders that this parable is being told to? The son will not have anything to do with this injustice, this rule breaking. I'm reminded last week of Jesus, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long I have wanted to gather you up as the mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you did not want that. Just as the father ran out to the younger son, he goes out now to the older son, meeting each of them where they are giving each of them not what they deserve, but what they need. The older son answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. <laughs> Whoa, these two sentences are loaded. The older son sees himself as a slave, revealing great bitterness and telling us that he feels even lower than a hired hand. He claims he has never disobeyed, but if one looks closely, we see he has alienated himself from the father just as the younger son did. Although the younger son physically cut off all ties, the older son did so emotionally. He was living his own life, working, yes, even obeying, but not for the right reasons not for a relationship with his father, not to share in all his father had. He was fulfilling the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. He is very much like the Pharisees that have a problem with Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors. He thinks he is so righteous. But this indignation reveals his selfish motives his sinfulness. He wants the young goat not to celebrate with the father, but to party with his friends. He doesn't even claim the younger brother as his brother. He says, this son of yours. Then he goes on to explain how his brother has lost all his money, saying it was with prostitutes. We're not told that. This son failed to recognize his constant position of privilege with his father. That all the time they were together, they shared goods in common. 
but he also fails to recognize that he is blind, even now to the fact that his father extends the same constant care and concern to him that he extended to the younger brother. Just as the Pharisees were full of envy and resentment at the sinners accepting the good news that Jesus proclaimed, the older son resents the younger son getting a celebration just because he has returned. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. But we had to, the father says. We had to celebrate because he was dead and he is alive. It was necessary. It's not the letter of the law, it's the spirit of the law and the fact. It's compassion. And compassion is righteousness. And did you notice the correction that the father lifts up? Where the older brother had said, that son of yours, the father says, this brother of yours. It took me back to the first brothers in Genesis after Cain kills Abel and God asks him, where is your brother? And Cain answers, am I my brother's keeper? Seems the answer is still yes. One of the purposes of this parable is for the listeners then and now to see how extravagant God's love is, that each of us will receive what we need, not what we deserve, when we return to God. And the purpose of this parable is for each of us to decide. Do we follow the letter of the law or the spirit of the law? It's up to us to decide Will we return to our extravagant, loving, and forgiving God? Could the Pharisees that grumbled to Jesus hear this parable and be moved to join the celebration? And what did the older brother decide to do? Episcopal priest Barbara Brown Taylor says, the older son wants his father to love him as he deserves to be loved because he has stayed put, followed orders, and did the right thing. He wants his father to love him for all of that. And his father does love him, but not for any of that any more than he loves the younger brother for what he has done. He does not love either of his sons according to what they deserve. He just loves them. More because of who he is than because of who they are. And the elder brother cannot stand it. He cannot stand a love that transcends right and wrong, a love that throws homecoming parties to prodigal sinners and expects the hardworking righteous to rejoice. He cannot stand it, and so he stands outside, outside his father's house, outside his father's love, refusing this invitation to come inside. The father invites the elder son back into relationship with him and his brother. He invites us to recognize our lostness, our foundness. 
Barbara Brown Taylor says it is up to each of us to finish this parable. Will we stand outside all alone being right? Or give up our rights and go inside and take our place at a table? Take our place where compassion and love reign. Our place at a table full of reckless and righteous saints and scoundrels. Brothers and sisters united only by our relationship with the one loving Father who refuses to give us the love we deserve but cannot be prevented from giving us the love we need. Thanks be to God. Amen. is lost, the Lord seeks them out. This is the Lord's holy table, and it is not full until all are present. Don't stand on the outside. It is Jesus inviting you to come, to be fed, to be filled. Feel the welcome of Jesus in the communion of all believers. With welcoming hearts, let us approach this meal alongside our sisters and brothers in Christ. Let us pray. It is a right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And on your holy mountain, he heard your still small voice. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ 
when you gave him to save us from our sin. Your spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles, and exalted him at your right hand. Now when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it, giving thanks to God. It was part of the Passover meal. It was a very scripted meal. The blessing that Jesus would have given would have been along the lines of, Blessed are thou, O Lord, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. That's the blessing they were expecting. But then he said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you eat it. They were not expecting that. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, which would have been along the lines of, Blessed art thou, O Lord, ruler of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. That they were expecting. But he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Christ's saving death until he comes again. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
and I meant to invite you to partake during Kelly's singing. So if you have not already, please partake of the body and blood of Christ given for you. Let us pray. Oh God, you have so greatly, lavishly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills, and our works as a continual thank offering to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, go into the world loved, forgiven, and found. May you see the love of God all around you. May you show the compassion of Christ in all that you do. And may you be surrounded by the Holy Spirit, filled by the Holy Spirit, as you seek guidance today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.